how are you? I'm Ashlyn. Nice to meet you if I haven't met you yet. Um, so, in the converse of uh, Valentine's Day, there is no free love. Let's talk about protection and litigation in chocolate wars. All right. Who can answer this question? We'll get. Oh, my. oh look, there's prizes. There's prizes. We'll get this. <laughs> Can this drop shape and paper flag be protected for chocolate candy? I do not know your name, young boy. dress and it is a di distinctive shape um, or so it was determined in 1924 when it was registered uh, it's been in use since 1921 the kiss shape um, and uh, it's still a registration in force and they just keep renewing it so thank you all right <clears throat> so um, why do you want to protect your brand including for Valentine's candy here's a hint um, okay, is anyone <laughs> familiar with this movie? Frozen. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> two more Frozen two. I feel like, yeah, 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 okay, wait, wait, wait. So who, I feel like, I don't know how much she did it. It's Professor Robert, she did this. So who else said Frozen 2? I didn't say anything. Anyone? Oh, that was me. That was you, okay, <laughs> yes. So, um, oh, so you gotta, why might the owners of Frozen 2 want to um, protect the intellectual property in uh, like the design, come on in, it's fine, uh, or the name, or the use of the pictures on the packaging, and I'll give you a hint, gallerycandy.com is selling this product. And it was not cheap for the amount of, of uh, chocolate that's in here, I will say that. Because it is, they came up with, Fro or Disney came up with Frozen and owned the rights to it. And so if they're using a chocolate that is advertising Frozen, I mean, it's part of the reason people are buying the chocolate and because it has Frozen too. And when people are attracted to buy this, this purchase of these roses, as opposed to right next door, you'll have chocolate roses that are not branded with, with a movie, but, but they'll choose to spend an extra $3 for this, right? And where does that money go? Disney. To Disney. Very good. So licensing and the making of money. All right, thank you for answering that. All right, so on this same theme, who, uh, who can tell me the owner of this brand? Yes. Uh, it's Marvel Avengers, but it's owned by Disney. Okay, good answer. All right, <laughs> Disney's got a lot of money coming into its pockets this day. <laughs> February and every day <laughs> and every day at what I hear is two hundred and four dollars a ticket but that's not even the beginning that's why I own stock in Disney um, all right why would you like to clear your product before you adopt it and start selling it let's start with this All right, so, actually, maybe this isn't the best way. So if I were to make a baking sheet, if I were to make a baking sheet that's shaped like the squares on a chocolate bar, um, can I enforce that? To encourage you to answer, <laughs> I have a special dark with almonds. <laughs> Uh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Yes. Can you protect it? I would say yes, 
because I think of kind of like the Tiffany's blue box, like this, the, the shape of the chocolate bar is like distinctly Hershey's, like. It, it, it may be. So I will say there was a lawsuit, and if you don't clear your brand, you can be sued, even if you end up settling or whatever, it costs you money. So you want to clear your, your as, something as simple as a, uh, as a chocolate bar mold before you start to put it on the market. When you think you're, you're fine, you're, you may not be. Um, all right, so, uh, so <laughs> why would you want to clear your brand? I feel like Professor <laughs> Sockett. Be answering those. I don't know. Um, does uh, anyone have a concern about if you were in house counsel making this product, would you have a concern about that? All right. Yes. Oh, what? Who on? It depends on how it's spelled, I guess, because the S is not in caps on the chocolate box, so I'm assuming it should be okay. The trademark is Jaws, not Jaw. But then again, the font kind of looks a bit similar. It alludes to it, so it's a bit of gray area. The yeah. teeth marks on the A. It's using, you've got the, the, the iconic movie series, which there are four movies in this series, um, uses the red, white, and blue, red, white, and aqua. And, uh, and interestingly, this box does not say, doesn't have the S large, right? It has the, it's your jaw sum, emphasizing the jaws of the shark. And then on the rear of the box, it really plays up the shark uh, side as opposed to maybe a movie side. Love infested waters, your jaw sum. <laughs> Just when you thought it was safe, now. But so, that's a jaws tagline. Thank yeah. you. Just when you thought it was safe, and I'm circling for your love. So, oh, and then let's get chummy. <laughs> let's get chummy. So, um, so Fuad, you were first. So, uh, so do you think it's okay? Will Jawson get a shark attack from Jaws? It, well, honestly, it's gonna depend. It depends. Oh, no, you gotta commit, Fuad. Okay, Come on. I'm committing that this this flies. You, you admit that this flies. All right. So it's, it's been flying. Actually, that box of candy has been for sale for at least three Valentine's Days in a row. And this is the sad thing about it being an IP uh, attorney. You can't help but, like, notice these things all the time. Now, it seems that uh, the key thing, if you were in-house counsel for the maker of Jawsum, um, you're going to look at the likelihood that they're going to sue you, and you may notice that the trademark registration for Jaws the movie has gone abandoned. It's, a, it's been allowed to lapse. Um, meanwhile, Universal Studios has, is using Jaws for a ride at their um, amusement park, but it's pretty narrow, and it seems uh, far afield of candy. Okay. All right, <laughs> this one cracks me up. All right. <laughs> okay. God, you found all these I, things. Yeah. Oh, it's so easy. You can't help but not see. I found this at Target. Okay. And um, and I said to my 12-year-old, I asked my 12-year-old daughter. I said, uh, uh, Does this look like anything to you? <laughs> she said, Mom, it's an Xbox remote. And I said, oh, OK. <laughs> so Xbox remote versus this game on uh, um, the game on um, the game, the game player. Um, what is the risk of a finding of infringement? I, it's someone else. Oh, yes, you. I think it's pretty low because while it has a lot of the features of the Xbox controller, the PlayStation controller and other similar ones like also look like that, and they did certain things to make it different than the Xbox controller, like having the, the way they stack the buttons in the center, mm -hmm. and then the way they switch the pad and the buttons on the left side. I think they're probably clear. All right, I think you're probably right so far. Here, um, what would you follow-up question? If you were in-house IP counsel, what would you do to investigate that? Oh, I would 
would yeah look at the look at what protection they have to see how broadly they're actually protecting their embodiment. So Microsoft in 2010 did in fact apply for this trade dress, citing use back to 2001. Um, um, but here's what happened. Oh, actually, I'm going to do a part two question. What do you think the refusal was for that for this application? Skittles in it for you. What was the refusal? Anyone take trademarks? <laughs> No? Okay. <laughs> All right. So you might think it might be functionality, but it was, it was uh, that there was a non-distinctive configuration was the only refusal basis. So I guess I get to keep the Skittles. Um, so <laughs> they're mine. Um, interestingly, Microsoft did not um, challenge this. They got enough use that they could have uh, asserted acquired distinctiveness, but they didn't. They let it lapse. And so it went dead, 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 lemon dead uh, in 2011. Okay, anyone play tennis? You play tennis and you play tennis. All right, good, because I got two things. Who's actively playing tennis amongst you guys? Not active, are you actively playing? No. Okay, maybe I get to keep these for my dog. All right, so, um, okay. All right, uh, love, love versus pen tennis balls. What do you think the risk is of finding infringement? Although you did already. You guys both answered. So can I ask Summer? Did you raise your hand, Summer? Yes. Okay. All right. Summer. What is the risk of finding infringement for the pens? For love, love. For love, love. Um, I mean, the writing isn't that similar. It's a different... Well, the three, sh well, okay. So it depends on what they're trying to protect. So is it all the love as well as the three stripes? <coughs> it's all the love and the three stripes. Like they say the three stripes are very similar to the three stripes on the other one. So I think there could be a risk. You think there's a risk? Could be. Yes, Miss Avengers, Marvel. Um, the shape of the tennis ball and the coloring and the, um, the lines are the exact same as on a normal tennis Okay. And they still also look fuzzy, which is kind of weird since it's a gummy candy. Yeah. <laughs> I, you're right. That's they, it's like a flocked candy yeah, gumball. Yes, that, okay. Yeah. yeah, so um so that was pretty skillful. All right. So, I'm going to tell you that Pen has has been around since 1972, but they have had many owners. General Tire and Rubber Company, um then GenCorp Inc., then Pen Racket Sports, and now Head Technology. So this, uh, this product has Head on it. So Head is the current IP house uh, doing enforcement on this. If you look through the trademark registrations for Pen, you'll see that they're, uh, they, only ha they only have an active standard uh, words only mark, so they don't really have protection in the design mm -hmm. element of the, of the font. Um, they have unregistered rights, for sure, but they don't have registered rights, and that's an indication of whether they're going to really enforce the, the design elements, right? So, um, so thank you for participating. Do you two want to battle out who gets the gummies, or who gets the uh, gumballs? I don't play tennis. And tennis. All right. No, I don't. Sure. Okay. You can share. It is Valentine's Day. Yeah, these are good for dogs. Okay, all right, moving on. Okay, all right. Okay, is Minnie Mouse registered? Uh, someone who hasn't answered yet. Is Minnie Mouse registered? I would say so. Yes. Good job. Wow. Look at that. <laughs> Hello. You are correct. <laughs> And these are the trademark registrations for both Mickey and Minnie. So good job. All right, um, let's talk about non-traditional trademark registration. What was protected for Play-Doh? And for someone who, yeah, that's right. Oh, okay, Rachel. Uh, the smell. Of the the smell of it. Very good. All right, can you pass that to Rachel? All right. 
Don't eat it, guys. <laughs> Don't eat it. Um, yeah, I think it's considered safe to eat. But uh, anyway, uh, so if you open up one of the some of those shareable Play-Doh things, not that you're required to, you're you're, you're fine. Um, it should smell like a sweet, slightly musky vanilla fragrance with slight overtones of cherry combined with the smell of a salted wheat-based dough. So that's, that was registered in 2018. Okay. Okay. So, I'm actually I'm going faster. Um, who owns Conversation Hearts? Mars. Mars? You have it wrong. But I will <laughs> give you a bag of conversation hearts for participating. Good guess. All right. Anyone else? Who owns the, the, uh, you, is anyone who hasn't? Sue, Sue and I guess Neko. You guess Neko? Yeah. You're wrong, but thank you for guessing. But if we were like five years earlier, would we have been right? Uh, no, actually, no. Oh. You wouldn't have been. Oh, still Neko used to, uh, okay. Uh, yes, that's her I'm going to hope that nobody owns Conversation Hearts. You are correct! Yay! <laughs> All right, so, and here's your Conversation Hearts. Thank you. 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 Thank when you uh, register a trademark, your identification of goods and services is supposed to include the generic terminology for what your product is. And if ever there's an indication that a phrase is generic, it's when it shows up in someone's identification of goods and services. In the case of Sweethearts, which is one type, not, it's not Brock's, which I've been handing out, but in the case of Sweethearts, um, they did get registration for Conversation Heart Candy. Neko. Neko, um, is that Neko? Yeah, yeah that, so that is owned by yeah. Neko. So Neko themselves, it, like, went with its generic, right? They themselves permitted that identification of goods and services to read as a generic phrase. Um, instead, what they opted to do was to protect the trademark Sweethearts which was, so Neko was the house brand, Sweethearts was the product brand, and the generic description of what the good was, was conversation heart candy. So. <clears throat> oh, gosh, I'm already kind of at the end. Let's see. Uh, okay, so what's your favorite love song? <laughs> Okay, what? Tunnel of Love by Bruce Springsteen. Tunnel of Love. I don't have IP on that, but <laughs> I do have All You Need Is Love. So do you want uh, You Rock My World? That's what I was doing. That. Or, oh, I was doing that. Right? Just in the middle. So there's a Beatles song. Does anyone like the Beatles? I like the Beatles. All right, okay, you have long answer. So, <laughs> all right. So, all right. Beatles fans. All right. So, no. Yeah, you better like because I'm coming to the end. You guys better. <laughs> you have it. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, all you need is love is a song by the Beatles, which I'm sure the Beatles fans are uh, familiar with. I was curious what trademark registration was under that. Turns out there's a. Um, a, uh, a catalog ordering service for sexual entertainment products that has the registration to all you need is love. And this is where we can talk about defensive registration. Sometimes you might want to cert register, you know, file for registration because you're concerned about something like this happening. Now, a title doesn't of a song doesn't normally engender trademark protection. It's not normally a source indicator. But in the case of a well-known um, uh, song like All You Need Is Love, if you did the right marketing around it, it might work. Um, there is a uh, cover 
or a um, like a tribute band that also has a trademark registration for all you need is love. Not related, as far as I can tell, to the sex entertainment products retail store. Okay, so uh, we will, I don't know. I guess I would have concluded with Love Machine. But instead, I will ask so one, disco. what? I said I'm looking genre disco. Oh. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> um, I will instead conclude with Cadbury um, chocolates. Uh, so, um, all right. Who thinks this is a protectable color? Summer does a lot, and and you're a new person. You think it's a protectable color? Yes. Yes. You're actually right in the UK. I didn't actually check uh, around of time. But anyway, based on my shopping experience, I believe that um, it is not protected in the United States because I can buy both. So uh, you're going to get two prizes and you can share. So thank you, everyone. In the UK, the registration covers only the Pantone color, which is, does not include the shine factor. But um, yeah. So, okay. Thank you. Okay. Happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> um, and thanks so much for Professor Bartow for planning the event. Yes. You need to hold the handheld microphone. I the do. Yes. Oh, I, Hello. Can you hear me? Is this on? No. no. How about? Yeah. <laughs> we got it. We got sound. Okay. Um, all the candy and more and chocolate chip cookies related to my talk is on that table. So please do eat it. Um, and I specifically pointed out to Professor Bartow that if we got the kind that comes in small packages, you can throw it in your backpack for later, um, which is lots of fun. So I am um, going to talk about two cases. So I'll split my time that way. Um, one of them is mostly a trademark infringement case, and it has a very extensive written opinion. The other one is a false advertising case under the Lanham Act, and it does not. So it's going to be a little bit more like an issue spotter. So we'll hopefully have some fun with it. Okay, so in 2007, Hershey sued Promotion in Motion, um, alleging infringement and dilution of its Kisses mark, and its Kiss mark, too. Um, it's registered trademarks for chocolate candies. Um, and so it did not like PIM's decision to use Swiss Kiss in connection with chocolate. And it also sought to cancel the Swiss Kiss registration. So there's a lot going on here. Actually, um, it's kind of a, we could do like a whole survey of trademark law using just this one case. The court ultimately found no infringement, no dilution, but also no bona fide use, which is amazing because I just came from um, teaching trademark law to about half of you five minutes ago, and that was the topic of the day. So, um, so like I said, this case brings up a lot of fun issues, genericness, distinctiveness, deceptiveness, abandonment, in addition to infringement and dilution. Um, I'm going to focus mostly on the infringement piece and the use piece. Oh, I'm sure to slide. Yeah, too bad. Okay, so um, so Kiss and Kisses for Chocolate Candy now are both registered, and in fact, Hershey has like 30, 40, 50 registrations that include the word Kiss or the word Kisses. Um, but what's interesting, and especially interesting in light of Professor Lembry showing us how long the trade dress has been registered, is that Hershey wasn't able successfully to register um, its the word kisses until 2001. And it tried a couple of other times and it failed. And the reason, am I, good. Um, I feel like I'm coming in and out on the mic. The reason is that kisses, once upon a time, was descriptive or even generic. So little bits of chocolate, little pieces of chocolate were called kisses. Did anyone know that? 
Yeah, I did not know that. Um, but what I just discovered also this week is that that story is cited in an amicus brief that a professor I know is filing in the Supreme Court Booking.com case to support the theory um, that just because something was once generic once upon a time doesn't actually mean that it can never become a trademark. Because um, Kisses is a pretty great example, right? It has pretty strong substantial trademark meaning, probably for most of us. But if you go back to the early 1900s, um, apparently it did not. Which is maybe why we get such broad use of kiss and kisses in chocolate. So I'm going to walk over here for a second. Actually, I'll start with my gift, which is bocce, which is what? Kiss in Italian. Kiss in Italian, yeah. Um, what else? These are peanut butter kisses made by the Mary Jane brand. We got all kinds of Hershey kisses. Um, and we have these really interesting chocolate covered prunes. And all of you, I hope, will taste test them and let me know what you think. Are they amazing? Are they disgusting? Are they something in between? When Professor Bartow called to specially order them for this event, she was corrected and told that they are not chocolate covered prunes they are, in fact, chocolate-covered dried plums. Chocolate dried plums. Uh, because it's all about branding, really, obviously. Uh, what else do we have here? So up on the slideshow, right, we have Kiss Me for chocolate frogs. We have Kiss Blarney, which I found an image of. I don't know what it is. I think maybe it's a, a peppermint rum fudge bar. The Kissing Game Champagne Kisses by Jacques Torres. Lammies, Lammis, I don't know this brand. Um, they sell kisses. That's a pretty big use of kisses, right? That's like dominating the whole packaging. Um, and then we have the Sunsweet. I forgot to mention um, that the chocolate covered dried plums are called French kisses, which I think um, I have a lot to say about. Anyway, Barton's also sells kisses, caramel kisses. Um, and then bocce up in the upper right hand corner. Those are just the ones that I quickly found images of. So the court actually cites like 30 or 40 others to kind of show the landscape. Um, oh, I said I wanted to mention abandonment. Another fun fact I learned when I was reading this case was that um, Hershey was selling chocolate kisses, branded chocolate kisses from 1907. That was their date of first use. But they did cease use for a while in the 1940s and the reason was a, sh a foil shortage. Um, so abandonment is OK, or abandonment can be rebutted, the presumption of abandonment, if there's kind of a good justification, a good excuse. And um, this is a candy that really relies heavily on the use of foil, right? That's like part of the packaging, part of the branding. That's how these are individually wrapped. So you can see how it might be justifiable for Hershey to say, you know what, there's no foil right now. I was not aware of the great foil shortage of, of 1940 whatever, but now we know. Um, so foil came back around, the industry recovered. This seems like something you would know, right? Because you're my, my... Okay, great. Um, so, so foil rebounded and Hershey was off and running again selling all kinds of kisses. Okay, so... The defendant, promotion in motion, applies to register Swiss Kiss for use in connection with chocolate. What do you think happens? The USPTO says that might be deceptive. Unless it's Swiss, we want to know if it's actually Swiss, right? And if it's not deceptive, if the chocolate actually is Swiss, then um, it might be geographically descriptive. So boo-hoo, you're probably gonna, not going to get that registration. Swiss Kiss creatively said, no, no, that's not true. Um, it's really not descriptive. You know why? Because it rhymes. You know, it's a catchy composite term. It doesn't make people think so much about it being Swiss. In fact, it is Swiss. Uh, but we don't think it's geographically descriptive. And ultimately um, prevailed, <laughs> until the time of the suit, ultimately prevailed on that argument for registration. OK, so in 2004, the USPTO sends a notice of allowance. In 2005, Hershey sends a cease and desist letter. Then it um, files a cancellation for the registration. And then it goes ahead and sues. 
So Hershey kind of comes out guns blazing and is like, no, no to Swiss Kiss. I lost my clicker, which is what I usually do. Anybody see it? Yes. It's under the chocolate. Cool. Okay. So we got to look at the lap factors, right? We got to think about the likelihood of confusion. What do you think about the similarity? I know Professor Bartow told you there would be no cold calling. <laughs> are Swiss kiss and kiss or kisses, are they similar? Maybe yes, maybe no. I'm getting some eh. Yeah, the court said they're not that similar. They said S and K are really different letters. Swiss kiss is pretty different from kisses or kiss. You have a whole extra syllable on there. It's a rhyming syllable. Um, the court also does something interesting, which is focus a little bit on the presentation, which we don't always see in the context of um, infringement claims based on word marks. But the court says, look, look at the way that they're marketing, look at their packaging, look at their use of like the Swiss Alps and the skyline and the Red Cross and all these other symbols. And then look at the Hershey Kiss, which is iconic, which is a very specific shape, right? So, um, so the court found that the, the similarity, that the two marks were not gonna be that confusing. <coughs> How about the, the strength of the plaintiff, plaintiff's mark? Um, this is one that before I read this case, I might have thought weighed really heavily toward Hershey, both in inherent and acquired distinctiveness, but now I know that inherent distinctiveness is actually very low, right? But we do have really solid acquired distinctiveness, right? But we also have that really extensive third-party use, okay? So we have a lot of other players who are using kisses in connection with <coughs> chocolate. Okay, I gotta speed it up so we can get to our second case. Okay, so how sophisticated are consumers? There's this whole elaborate discussion in here about like premium chocolate versus non-premium chocolate and whether we care. And if Hershey Kisses sell for three or four dollars and premium chocolate sells for five dollars but there's less of it, how much are consumers paying attention? So I thought that was pretty interesting. A um, Lot of other overlap, right? A lot of product similarity. And we also had some surveys, and the surveys were weird because the, um, the expert conducting the survey decided to just use white index cards and then write the mark with a marker. And the um, control that they used was Swiss, Swiss, Swiss fish. So they were like, Swiss kiss, Swiss fish. Does it make you think of any particular brand? Um, and the expert from the other side was like, man, that was a terrible survey. That is not how surveys work. Right? We don't expect to see the two products side by side, but we expect to see the mark in a little bit more context. Like we expect to see the mark the way that it is used. Um, the punchline here was that PIM wasn't really making use yet. So PIM wasn't really on shelves. So the expert couldn't exactly you know, go to the store and buy some Swiss Kiss chocolate and use that to conduct a survey. But the survey that they did was not super compelling. Okay, so no infringement, ultimately, no finding of dilution. And then the court circles back to this question of whether Swiss Kiss really deserves a registration at all, right? Did it make a bona fide use in commerce? And it didn't do much, but it had pretty good reason for not doing much. So PIM um, shipped a shipment to a company called Continental. It included 50 cases of Swiss Kiss products which totaled 1,200 bars of chocolate for over $1,000 um, to promote the business, to test the product. Continental paid, but then it got paid back. So it didn't really pay. Um, and after that, PIM filed its statement of use with the USPTO. So they said, look, we're making use in commerce. We got money. We sold goods. The goods uses the mark, um, you know, the, the product that we sent features the mark prominently, so we have use. USPTO said, okay. This court said, hold on. That's really not so great, right? That's really not what we expect to see when we're looking for bona fide use in commerce because you sent it to Continental, but do you have any awareness of Continental selling it to consumers, 
Um, and they, they put a couple people on the stand and everybody from PIM was like, we just assumed, like what else do you do with $1,000 worth of chocolate? Aren't you gonna put it on the shelf and sell it? Um, and the lawyers were like, okay, but do you know that they did that? And the witnesses said, no, we don't really know that they did that, we were just guessing, right? So as you sit here now, you can't testify under oath that any consumer in America has ever purchased any product under the name or mark Swiss Kiss. I'm not certain if they have or they haven't. I'm not sure what happened to the product we shipped to Continental. All we know is that we shipped it, right? Um, and the court cites another case about chocolate that involves kind of one giant shipment and basically says, at the end of the day, what we're looking for is consumer-facing use. So did the chocolate end up on a shelf? Could consumers walk into a store, pay money for the chocolate, right? See the mark, experience the mark, um, and actually get the goods. And um, the court says it didn't, right? So this is interesting. It made me think a little bit of the, of the Adidas at a zero case we talked about the other day, where we said a couple of hats was enough. Um, and this is a lot of chocolate, right? This is 50 cases of chocolate across state lines. So in the one sense, that sounds pretty substantial. But on the other hand, um, yeah, we need use. We need, we need consumer-facing use in commerce. We need to open up the doors and say, come on in, give us money, and we'll give you Swiss Kiss chocolate. So ultimately, it was not such a happy ending um, for Swiss Kiss, except in the sense that with the finding of non-infringement and non-dilution, they could go ahead and make a real use. Um, the other thing that happened, the reason that that was the only use that Swiss Kiss had made was because of Hershey, right? They sent that one box, and then they started talking to Walmart, they started talking to other distributors, they were ready to sign some deals and ship some products, and then Hershey sent the C&D, and then Hershey sued them, and they were like, oh, maybe let's not do this right now. Maybe let's pause on the sales of Swiss Kiss, because the more Swiss Kiss we sell, maybe the bigger trouble we're gonna get in, right? So again, that might be um, a justifiable excuse in the abandonment context, but when we're looking for affirmative rights um, in a threshold way, we still need to have that kind of use. So that ended up being a decision that came back to bite them. Ooh, okay, we're gonna switch gears. We're gonna talk about a false advertising case that I thought was super fun. <laughs> the case is Nabisco v. Keebler. It did not go anywhere. Um, and ended up settling. So Chips Ahoy and Chips Deluxe. And um, Chips Deluxe has this big print and TV campaign in which it says bigger chocolate, bigger chocolate taste. Chips Deluxe beats regular Chips Ahoy, 25% more chocolate per cookie. Oh, that's a big old claim. I do not have the TV ad for you, but I do have these amazing screen caps. Okay, so postal worker delivers flowers, congratulations. Keebler's Chips Deluxe beat regular Chips Ahoy. Cookies in taste test. The postal worker is skeptical, but then he says, it's bigger. Hey, these have more chocolate. Um, Ernie the Elf shows the postal worker a scale weighing a Keebler cookie and responds 25% more in each cookie than regular Chips Ahoy. Okay, so we have a statement of fact there, right? 25% more chocolate in each cookie. We have plenty of both kinds of cookies, so you all will have to do a taste test. It ends with a picture of Keebler's Chips Deluxe packaging and mounds of chocolate chips. Hello, there we go. Okay, so we're under section 43A1B of the Lanham Act, and we're looking to establish a false or misleading ad claim, which requires, requires basically um, a false or misleading statement of fact in commercial advertising or promotion, deception, materiality, interstate commerce, and injury, right? So we know we have a national TV campaign. We're definitely in interstate commerce. We're definitely in commercial advertising or promotion. Um, and these two are close competitors. So injury, the injury can be to the plaintiff's goodwill, or it can be in the form of lost sales, right? If this is your close competitor and they're saying they have a lot more chocolate, then that looks potentially pretty likely. But do we have a false statement of fact? Do we have a false claim? Maybe 20, yeah. Uh, maybe misleading because the cookies look bigger. Ah, nailed it. Okay, 25% or more chocolate in each cookie. It is true. It was true at the time. 
Chips Deluxe con cookies contain 25% more chocolate than Chips Ahoy, but guess what? Chips Deluxe cookies are over 25% larger. So the same kind of cookie is the same amount of chocolate like per bite. It's the same distribution of chocolate. In fact, it's the same amount of chocolate per package. So Chips Ahoy says, look, in an 18 ounce package of, of each cookie, you get 34 Chips Deluxe or 50 Chips Ahoy, and the total amount of chocolate is gonna be pretty much the same. Same chocolate per bite, same per package, same density, same distribution of chips. So is that a false statement? Well, we have a few different kinds of um, false or misleading claims in advertising. So we can have a claim that's literally false on its face, um, and that might be an establishment claim, so it might be a kind of studies prove claim, 20% um, of people prefer X over Y claim, or it can just be an efficacy claim. So this product does what it's designed to do. This product you know, gets your laundry super white, something like that. Um, so 25% chocolate, 25% more chocolate in, in um, Chips Deluxe cookies is not literally false on its face right? But it might be literally false by necessary implication, or at a minimum, it might be misleading, right? Okay, so um, I'll give you a couple of examples of what that looks like. How can a claim be not literally false and yet impliedly false, implicitly false, or literally false by necessary implication? So one of my favorites is this case about uh, RoboCoop which is a Cuisinart competitor. And um, it ran an ad campaign that said, you know, there are this many Zagat rated, three star, five star restaurants in Paris, France. How many of them use RoboCoop uh, food processors and how many use Cuisinart? Well, guess what? The score is RoboCoop 21, Cuisinart zero. And the court said, yeah, hang on. Cuisinart doesn't make restaurant grade food processors. So there's a really strong implication here that all of these fancy restaurants chose RoboCoop over Cuisinart, but in fact, Cuisinart doesn't compete in that category. Cuisinart was never a choice for you at all, right? So that statement is more than just misleading. That statement is literally false by implication. So my guess is that might be what we're looking at there, but I think misleading is another um, solid categorization, right? Something seems a little bit off, a little bit misleading about um, touting that a cookie has 25% more chocolate or more chocolate chips in it, when in fact, kind of the chocolate density and distribution is exactly the same. Okay, and then on the question of deceptiveness, this is not from a uh, written opinion. As I said, the only written opinion in this case is actually about transfer of venue. So um, this is from like a, a brief, a branding brief, and it, what it says is, in this particular commercial, or in this set of commercials, the commercials aired on Nick Jr. The demographics are usually toddlers of all genders between the ages of two and six. What do we know about kids between two and six? Are they super discerning? Very critical thinking. Very critical thinking, yeah. They, they really say, well, hang on. Um, that other cookie looks bigger than that first cookie. So I don't think it actually has more chocolate, right? No, they do not. Um, in a subtle way, Keebler attempts to drive home the point that Chips Deluxe are more desirable than Chips Ahoy. Even if the young viewing crowd is unable to grasp this idea, the visual of seeing the one Chips Deluxe cookie on a scale that reads 25% more is enough for a toddler to understand Chips Deluxe have a lot of chips. Okay, guys, I don't know who these guys are, but um, most kids in that age range, can't, age range can't read. Five or six-year-old, maybe, but um, that's kind of pushing it. Two-year-olds are definitely not really understanding the 25% more. But anyway, when we think about deception, we have to think a little bit about audience, right? So, um, so when we're thinking about what's a reasonable understanding of these ad claims, then we want to know who our audience is. Um, one more I'll share with you real quick is this recent story. Um, this is not a, a set of Lanham Act claims. These are actually um, 
false advertising complaints essentially brought as consumer class actions under various state statutes. And here's what I learned from these stories. If you've seen white Reese's or you've seen white Kit Kats or any of these other white products, have you ever noticed that they don't say white chocolate? Because they are not made of white chocolate. Um, they are apparently just made of other stuff. <laughs> so arguably that's not false advertising, right? They're made of other stuff. They don't have the ingredient that would qualify them as white chocolate. And so they don't pretend to, right? Um, it just says white Reese's, it just says white Kit Kat. But the consumers in these two different class action suits say, listen, you positioned them as being white chocolate. You said, here are the kinds of Kit Kats there are, dark chocolate, milk chocolate, and white Kit Kat. And that led consumers to believe they were white chocolate. And in fact, some of the resellers also were confused. So some of the retail outlets that um, sold these products list them as white chocolate. And the complaint includes uh, a whole bunch of examples. So, um, so these are gonna be fun to watch. They were just filed, I think, both in the end of 2019, one in California, one in um, maybe New York or New Jersey under the um, Consumer Protection Acts. So um, those are gonna be interesting. They don't have the same requirements of a Lanham Act claim, but in a Lanham Act claim, we're always thinking about materiality, right? So Maybe there's a false statement. Maybe there's a misleading statement. Is it material to the purchasing decision? If you had known that a white Reese's wasn't made of white chocolate, would you never have bought it at all, right? Did it actually affect your purchasing decision? So I think that's a fun one. Um, I'm gonna stop there and see if anybody has questions. Awesome, has anybody tried the chocolate covered um, dry plum? Yeah, what do you think? Uh, they were good, but I didn't know what they were. <laughs> they were good, and I didn't even know what they were. Awesome, anybody else? Okay, yeah. They were good, but ask me in a few hours. <laughs> <laughs> they were good, ask me again later. Anybody else? All right, good, thumbs up, okay. Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you, Professor Lembry and Professor Barto, and happy Valentine's Day.